I'm going to talk to you today about Meta Revival. Everybody say, ooh, ooh. that sounds fancy. <laughs> meta, who knows what meta means? I'm not talking about, you know, the, the, the cybernetic Skynet force that oh, I'm, you know, runs Facebook or anything like that. But meta means trans. It's like the word trans or re or again. Um, and so when you think about like meta, what's, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Like what's the longer word? Metamorphosis, metamorphosis right? Um, and so metamorphosis is like to change form. I'm going from one form to the next. So think about that being applied to revival. All right, let's dive into it. Revival, who's, who's heard that word? Who's experienced a measure of revival in your life? Right? Um, we have a school of revivalists, you know. Um, why is my alarm going off? I have no idea. Crazy. I'm going to step over here. Side story. Uh, Emma was born on March 6th, and when she was in the OR room, well, well along with me and my wife and a bunch of doctors, they allowed Alicia to play some soaking music over the OR. Right, so Lisa had her phone hooked up, and they were doing the surgery, and you know, we're Jesus be here. This is so amazing. This is so great. Yay! There's great music on. All of a sudden, you know how you have alarms on your phone. The alarms started going off. You good? <laughs> Was that the glory or? I mean, you couldn't have timed it any better. I'm like setting up this thing. So yeah, so the soaking music's playing. All of a sudden, it stops, and her alarm starts going off over the speakers in the ER at the at OR OR. Yes, operating room. We're not in the ER. We're in the OR. And at that exact moment, the alarm was going off at eight o'clock in the morning, eight zero zero on the nose. Emma was actually brought into this world. Right? And so it's this crazy thing. So, interesting. Now's the time. So when I say revival or give a definition of revival, I'm going to kind of talk to you about traditional revival and then talk to you about what revival looks like in the kingdom culture. So my definition of revival, when sons and daughters awaken to their true identity and placement in God's family. It's definition number one. It's kind of like an individual thing. Like, wow, like I've always been a part of God's family, but I didn't know it. But here I am. I'm awakened to this idea that this is who I am. This is who he created me to be. Yay, Papa. Number two, this is like the, the, the cosmos, the cosmological scale. When creation is, resor- is restored to God's original intention, design, and purpose. Right? When you see that chaos, it's just kind of reeled back into God's design. Right? And so, sons and daughters who know their identity, they're seeing God's face, they're hearing His voice, they're feeling His presence, they're experiencing His love, and they're abiding in His pleasure, they're going to have a different outlook on life. Right? They're going to have an outlook on life that sees God's goodness in everything. They're going to have an outlook in life that sees God's glory and everything, right? They're not going to see problems. They're going to see solutions, right? They're not going to be focused on what the enemy's doing or what God's not doing. Their aim and their sight and their vision is going to be looking at everything that God is doing, right? And the more we foc- what we, we feed and we fuel what we focus on, you know, if I'm watching, you know, bad news all day long, that's going to begin to shape and warp my worldview according to how I'm being programmed. But if I'm, if I'm feasting on the Lord, if I'm in His Word, if I'm hearing from heaven, wow, I'm going to become like what I'm being programmed by. Does it make sense? Feasting on His presence, feasting on His goodness. I mean, you see that in the Psalms. You see David doing that over and over again. Lord, on Your Word, I will meditate day and night. Right? I'm becoming like who I am beholding. 
Because if you see his face when they see your face, guess, who fa- guess whose face they're going to see? They're going to see his face, right? If you hear his voice when they hear your voice, they'll hear his voice. If you feel his love when they feel your love, whoop, you're a conduit. His love's flowing through you. It's cascading through you. What, what, what is it about you? Like, what's going on, you know? Um, Alicia and I and Greg and Nancy were driving back from Wisconsin one time. And we had some worship on in the car. And man, who knows where Mount Eagle is in Tennessee? So like if you leave Chattanooga and you're going up towards Nashville, you got to go up this mountain, Mount Eagle. So we're coming back the opposite direction. And man, it's pouring, right? Cats and dogs, you know, meow, long windshield wipers. I try to make jokes. It doesn't always work. Just laugh. Just laugh. If you, if, if you hear something that doesn't make any sense, oh, that was supposed to be funny. Ha ha. Ha ha. And, I mean, God showed up in the car. So we're driving. It's pouring. There's semi-trucks everywhere. But we're just, we're getting sloshed in the inside and in the out. You know, but nature was also calling. So I stopped at the Hardee's on top of Mount Eagle and I ran inside and I looked at all the staff inside Hardee's and I said, hey, the Holy Ghost just fell in the car. Wow, is glory strong. I got to pee. <laughs> Walked back out and they're like, where are you from? <laughs> but questions like that often arise. If you're, if you're operating in the oozing glory and the liquid love of the Father, people get around you. What's, what's going on with you? What's different about you? When you come in to work, you change the atmosphere. What is that? That's like them saying, my heart is open to receive whatever you have to tell me. My heart is open to receive. So if you know you're loved, you can give love, you become love. I'm sorry, you receive love, you become love, and then what? You release love. Right? And it's not like, okay, I better love today. All right, I better love today. Oh, wait. I realize I'm loved, then love will be the natural response to realizing I'm loved, right? Everyone wants to be seen. When I realize I've, I've, I'm seen, then I won't worry about being seen in front of others. I'll, I'll be more concerned about seeing them. Everybody wants to be seen, known, heard, and that's awesome. Hey, Papa, look at me, especially who has kids, you know? Like your kids want you to be proud of them. They want, to, they want you to see them, right? But where's the greater joy in being seen or acknowledging, yes, I see you. Oh, wait, you see me. I feel seen. I feel my identity is coming alive. So revival has this thing to where each one of us experiences a metamorphosis. Each one of us experiences a transformation, right? And it's, 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 you know, it's the perichoresis, right? Perichoresis is the divine dance. Every day I'm dancing with the Lord, discovering more and more of my identity and union with Him, right? Every now and then I might step on this foot. Oh, sorry, Jesus, you know. But He's leading me. He's guiding me. And He's like, if I don't know where to step, guess what I can do? I can just step on His feet. You know? As Papa Leif Hedlund says, ba da 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 boom boom Right? So it becomes this divine dance with us. Everybody say metanoia. metanoia. Who's heard that word before? Right? So I'm about to blow your minds. You ready? So metanoia, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but I did study some Greek scholars when it comes to this word. So metanoia is the Greek word that we often translate as what? Repentance, right? Who's heard the word repentance? All right, before I get going into this, don't hear what I'm not saying, right? I'm not throwing out our traditional view of repentance. What I'm about to do is try to take what we've always known about it and expand it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? You know, when we live in the Western culture, sometimes we think, well, if this is true, well, then the equal and opposite can also be true as either one or the other. That's not how the kingdom works, Right? You know, there might be something here that's true. Oh, wait, this might be a little bit truer. Oh, wow, this might be the truth. But then you have God's perspective, right? And he's, he is the definition of truth. 
So we're going to expand for a minute our definition of repentance so we can then take that and apply it to our definition of revival. All right? Everybody say the word repentance. repentance. You ever thought about like how that word sounds? Like what it sounds like? Hmm. Right? So, if, so metanoia, right, in the Greek it means to change the way that you think. To think again or think from above, or think from a heavenly place, or to trans-think, or have a metamorphosis in your mind. The word repentance shows up somewhere in the Middle Ages, and so some scholars believe that it is actually a word that is metanoin, and that they got the translation a little bit off there. So all of a sudden you see a word appear in Scripture that kind of sounds more like, wait, i got to repay something versus I need to transform into something. So the word metanoin means to repay blood money. And the word repentance, noia, no, gnosis, means to think again. Like the word literally re is the same as trans or meta. Re, think, but this time think again from a heavenly place. And over here... This is more like, hey, wait a minute, you better pay back something. Right? And so, if you, if you look at how the word's been used throughout church history, you kind of have like a thing to where you're, you have two people, or say two uh, points of view, looking at God from two different angles. Right? So over here, I'm constantly trying to repay God. Lord, forgive me of my sins. I repent. Change me. You know, so it's, it's, it's coming from a place where I don't really know my identity. I'm identifying with everything that Jesus saved me from. And over here, wait, I'm thinking again. I'm thinking from above. Now I'm identifying with everything that Jesus saved me too. Does that make sense? So I'm looking at it kind of from two different angles. You know? So after Jesus died, who knows what Judas did? Hmm? Hung himself. What did he do right before that? He went and he tried to take the money back. And they said, we don't want this money. It's blood money. And so he threw the silver into the temple. And then he went. So he tried to undo what he did by repaying the blood money. Right? Does it make sense? So one point of view, it's not, I'm not saying repentance is incorrect. I'm saying it's the love of God that leads us to repentance, but repentance, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me, washing my sins, opens the door for us to now jump over here and experience metanoia, to think from above. Oh, wait, now I am washed, now I am cleansed, now I am transformed. Does it make sense? I spent, I spent many years trying not to sin. I've worked really hard at trying not to sin. Follow my face. Lord, I repent. Oh, I'm feeling really good. Oh, I had a bad thought. Oh, I looked at something I shouldn't have. Oh, I sinned. Oh, I repent. Oh, wait. I'm feeling really good. Oh, wow, Jesus. Thank you for your glory. Because I was measuring my ability to stand in this presence based on how naughty or nice I had been. Not who I really was. So it's just like Paul said in Romans. There's a constant war. You know? He loves me. Oh, he loves me not. You know, if we go back to the beginning, God said, it is good, it is good, it is good. You heard me talk about that a few weeks ago. And then when he looks at man, he says, oh, it's very good. Right? And then Adam and Eve, you know, they do something they were told not to. And so they immediately began to try to punish themselves and hide behind figs. And what does God do? Comes walking in the cool of the day. Where are you guys at? He didn't ask that question for their sake, or for his sake. He asked it for their sake. Hey, you strayed over here into a thought pattern about me that's incorrect. But don't worry. I'm going to come as you to undo that. So you can get out of this cycle of trying to cover up everything that you did was wrong and realize how I've always seen you. Does it make sense? Yep. Meta. 
So what I'm doing this morning is I'm building a paradigm for us to, to expand. Religion is good. It means bonding with God. But if bonding with God equals religious restrictions, then I'm trying to behave my way into the kingdom. But if I come over here to the vein of relationship, wow, I'm being loved into the kingdom. And there's so many directions I can go. The story of the prodigal father, or the good father, is the gospel in a nutshell, right? You've got religion and you've got rebellion, but you have the loving father masterfully handling how to care for both sons right in the midst of both of their messes. Isn't that good? Well, that was free. Not one of that was in my notes, but we're going for it. You guys all right? You okay? Are we still good? All I want to do is just expand repentance a little bit. I'm not trying to get rid of it. You know, erase it off the dry erase board. But what if we look at it a little bit differently? What if we look at it from a different angle? I like this painting because, wow, I can get so much out of it. But what if I shift it and turn it to its side? Oh, wait a minute. I've never seen that before, even though I've been looking at it the whole time. That's the beauty of Scripture. Oh, wait a minute. I've never seen that before even though I've been looking at it the whole time. Right? Is that cool? I'm going to keep going in my brand new notebook. that sound good? <laughs> Metanoia. So it's a metamorphosis of the spirit. It's a metamorphosis of the mind. And it's a metamorphosis of the body. Right? So where do you start? You guys ready? I don't even think I can do the caterpillar. <laughs> All right, I'm not even going to try. I'm sorry. I know. That was the most exciting part of the message so far. <laughs> Look at my mic, right? I just, I don't know. Just transform your mind and envision me doing the caterpillar. All right? So it's an awakening, a quickening, and it's, it's, it's me coming more alive every single day. So there's this, beauty, this beautiful tension. We already have everything we need in Christ. He died once for all, has given us everything. But here's, here's, here's the mystery. Let's say I inherit a cave. Right? And this cave is like 100 miles deep and 10 miles wide and has thousands of caverns. And each one of those is filled with different kinds of jewels. Will it take me more than a lifetime to discover everything that I already own? Probably. Any spelunkers in here? A spelunking? Hey, we have a spelunker in the house. But that's, how, that's the inheritance of the riches of Christ. It's, it's endless. We already have access to all of it, but it will take us a lifetime to discover what's already freely been given and what's already ours. You guys tracking? Oh, they need to be trained. You guys ready? So if I say, if I, if I ever say, are you guys tracking? You got to say choo-choo. No, it's chugga-chugga? <laughs> chugga-chugga. All right. All right. <laughs> are you guys tracking? Chugga-chugga. Oh, great. That's awesome. Yes. So metanoia in us yields metanoia in creation. So you have the layer of revival that hits God and his people, and then you have the layer of revival that hits all creation. And creation itself begins to transform and reflect its original design and intention, which is the image of God. So you see metanoia in people, in land, in cities, in the nations. Who's ever seen the transformation videos? You got these cities in different parts of the world, and the Sentinel group went to these different cities that were experiencing a revival. And they would go into the cities, and they couldn't find anyone who wasn't saved. And then they went to the garden. And guess what? Carrots. This big. Squash. It might actually squash you. The land itself was responding to the reality that the people had stepped into. When the people knew their identity, even the plants stepped into, they had a metanoia. Their identity went to a new level. And not only did they yield more fruit, they yielded bigger and more plentiful fruit. Right? And they have all of this documented. We have smartphones, right? We, have, we all have supercomputers in our pockets. All of this stuff's online. You can check it out. All right. What 
time is it? Oh, I, I forgot how to change the time on my watch. And it says it's 12. I was like, man, that went by real quick. All right, so we're doing good. Oh, uh, yeah, my, my, okay, yeah. All right, what's up? All right, real quick, let's compare traditional revival and kingdom revival, right? Anything given from heaven to earth doesn't have an expiration date. It's always spiraling upwards, and it's always expanding, right? So the Hebraic concept of time is kind of like a spiral. It goes like this, and it starts to go skyward. Right? And that's why things in Scripture that are prophetic can have kind of multiple fulfillments because the first fulfillment was designed and set up and engineered by heaven to have a second fulfillment. This time it's a little bit bigger, it's a little bit more awesome. Right? And then this time it's a little bit bigger, it's a little bit more awesome. Right? You see this in the Old Testament with the prophets. The Messiah is coming. Next generation. Ooh, the Messiah is coming. Next generation, the Messiah is coming, and they're getting more language, and they're getting more articulate. But why was John the Baptist the greatest of the Old Testament prophets? Because he's the only one who could say, here he is. Everyone else said, he's coming. John got to say, behold. Right? But as soon as John says, behold, John steps out of the picture. He must increase, I must decrease. Right? Right? Now, we can take that scripture and, oh, Lord, bless me and more of you. I understand the, the heart behind that. But in that situation, what John was talking about is everything has just shifted now that he's here. And so you see this progressive revelation unfold from the Old Testament to the New. It's a metanoia to a metanoia to a metanoia to a metanoia. Tracking? Doing good? All right. So in traditional revival, it's kind of, a lot of them were kind of our old understanding of repentance based and they bore a lot of fruit. You saw a lot of people come into the kingdom. You know, traditional revivals are characterized by repentance, presence, manifestations of the Holy Spirit and visitation, right? Those are awesome. I'm going to tell you in a minute. I, I went to Brownsville Revival. I went to the School of Ministry there. Who's heard of the Brownsville Revival? Right? I'll, I'll fill you in in a second. That was awesome. It was wonderful and glorious. Um, but it kind of aligned with some of the things I just mentioned. Kingdom Revival. Transformation. So it's not just repenting, but it's actually being transformed. And it's not just God's presence, but this is tangible presence. It's not just manifestations, but the signs, wonders, and miracles. And it's not just visitation, but it's habitation. habitation, right? It's where God's dwelling. That's why I really love what God's doing at Bethel. Uh, you know, I, I've been kind of tracking with Bethel since 1999. And if you look at what's happening there, they said right at the outset, they were having a breakout revival in 1996, just like... Toronto and just like Brownsville and they said you know what it's not going to be healthy if we burn out you know at Brownsville they went for it night after night day after day night after night day after day which was an awesome glorious time that's something that's really hard to sustain from one generation to the next much less well, from one week to the next and Bethel said hey let's protect our physical health while, while our spirits are soaring right and so when you had that happen all of a sudden, you didn't have people burning out because they had to be at a meeting. You had people getting refreshed and restored so that when they went into their work environment, they would see transformation. You heard of the Welsh Revival. Right? So in 1904, just before the Azusa Street Revival, there's a revival in Wales led by Evan Roberts. And this young man, well, you'll hear a lot more about it when you guys sign up for School Revivalists, yes. Um, but he, he was a young man, um, was he 17 when it started? Or 19? I think he was 19. But he just, he was at a prayer meeting and he heard this old preacher named Seth Joshua say, bend me, O Lord, bend me. There was something inside of him when he heard that prayer, he just began to burn. He began to pray, bend me, O Lord, bend me. 
And then him and his friend, Sidney Evans, were walking, and they were just dreaming together about what God can do in their land and in their generation. And suddenly they looked up. It was a, it was a nice night. They saw the, the moon was shining right there. And they saw an arm stretched out from the moon come down into the land and pick up the nation of Wales. And they look at each other, and Evan asks his friend a question. What if we, what if we begin to believe God for 100,000 souls to come into the kingdom? And his friend was like, well, we have to do Facebook marketing. We have to, uh, <laughs> we have to get some meetings together and schedule. No. And I'm not knocking that. We have tools that we can use, and that's awesome. They just looked at him and said, yeah, I'll believe God with you for that. A few weeks later, they're, just, they're, they're hungry. They're burning for Jesus, and they're like, they, they get permission from the preacher to have a small meeting after the service. And how many people showed up for that meeting? About 17. All right? What's the, what's the saying? Big things have small beginnings, right? 17 people showed up for a meeting, and Evan just began to share his heart, and guess who shows up with him? Holy Spirit. Ah. And then what to trickle out into community. God showed up at the meeting the other night. And so, I, you know, the next weekend, people came again to the church, how many came? In one week? A week later? 2,000. And guess what happened at the end of six weeks? Guess how many souls had come into the kingdom in just six weeks? 100,000. From dreaming to getting together to sharing their hearts, in just six weeks, 100,000 people had come into the kingdom. What if we just dare to believe God to do that here? All right? Man. If you can do it then, you can do it for, for us. And it says the closer we get to Jesus' unveiling, the more it's, everything's increasing. And it might just go viral. Not because we want it to, but because Jesus has it set up. All right, so the Welsh Revival. One of the things they did in the Welsh Revival, though, is they, they shut everything down. They quit going to work. They quit going. They shut down the football games, real football, soccer. You know, they shut everything down so they could just go to church all day. How long do you think that lasted? It didn't last long because you, like, you kind of need like, people to farm and work and manufacture goods and have food and things like that, right? And so after about a year, they all just slowly began to go back to work because there was this idea that like revival meant you separated yourself over here, right? And so they stopped work to be a part of the glory, right? So if we look at that, if we metanoia, if we can learn from, from what they went through, kingdom revival brings the heart of worship that transforms work. We don't stop work to worship. We bring worship into work. See the difference? And then, just like the illustration I made last week, and you're going to hear me make it over and over again because I just love it. Whatever you're doing for work, it could be a design, it could be a, making a coffee, whatever it is. They take a little sippy sippy of what you're creating. Whoa. That's a latte. Where are you from? What's going on? Why is this different? Why did I suddenly forgive myself because I drank a sip of coffee? Why did I feel something break off of me? I was tormented like five seconds ago, but what's going on here? Right? Jesus would go up on the mountain and pray, and then he would come down the mountain and slay. Right? All his battles were won in the presence of the Lord. When he comes down here, everything is just realigning itself according to the battle he had just won in prayer. Right? You guys are starting to feel it. I can see it in your faces. Your faces are like, I'll have some of that sippy sippy. 
I mean, Emma, when she's ready for some sippy sippy, she doesn't hold back. She tells us right then, now. I would like some milk now. I don't know why 20 seconds have gone by and there's not a bottle. Are you confused? Let me, let me reiterate this. All right. And so what I'm doing here, again, you guys are getting to know us, but our hearts burn, our hearts do burn for revival. But there's something beyond that. It's called the identity of sons and daughters of God. Who knows who Leif Hetland is? So Leif Hetland is our spiritual father, and I was in his office one day. I was, I didn't do anything. I was just there, right? And Leif just comes by. He walks by me, and he goes, Dave, you're more than a revivalist. And he just rips that label right off my head. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm more than a revivalist. Wait a minute. Oh, wait. What, what is that? Oh, I was identifying with what I was doing. Not identifying with who I was, which was a son. And when he ripped that label off, I was able to step into a sonship I had never known before. Oh, wow. And then I began to see revival. <laughs> by realizing I was a son, right? You guys doing good? All right, so how do we bring this revival, like how, what does kingdom revival look like? You have covert revival and you have overt revival. Covert revival, I go to work, I get there early, I stay late and I work hard. What are you talking about, bro? They just, they, they said, bend me, O Lord, and the Spirit showed up and wow. Back when I was a youngster, I was a flower cutter at a florist. Yeah, no, did you know there were such things? And so we worked at this floor. I was working at this florist in Pensacola, and all the flowers would come in. It was a wholesale florist, not just a regular florist, right? All these flowers would come in from out of the country. And my job was to cut them. I had this machine. I would whack the flowers and put them in water. And whack the flowers and put them in water. And it was very monotonous, yes. So I get there at like 6 o'clock in the morning, and we work till about 1, and because the, you know, because you had to get the flowers cut and then delivered to the local florist, so they would have product to sell. And so after a couple of weeks of working, I would, like, I would get there at 6, I'd cut about half the flowers on Monday, and i cut half of them on Tuesday. So it took me two days worth of work, about, you know, what, 16 hours maybe? And so the guy took me into the corner. And he's like, man, I don't know what you're doing back there lollygagging, but all those flowers need to be cut on Monday. They don't need to sit there overnight. I was like, what? Like, cut my time in half? I was like, all right, I'll get it done. So I went home. I was like, Lord, there's got to be a strategy. There's got to be a solution to this. How can I do this? How can I work well and do the job they asked me to do? I wasn't like, oh, you stupid boss. He's expecting the impossible. Now he called me higher. And I said, okay, Lord, how do I get there? What's the strategy? What's the solution? And he kind of gave me a picture of like how I was cutting it and filling the buckets with the solution and stuff like that. So I got this heavenly download and strategy to just to be able to cut flowers. Right? Is this intriguing? Flower cutting, metanoia, hands coming out of moons, and chugga chugga. This is great, right? We're doing awesome. <laughs> I get there the next morning, I got some glory tracks going on in my ear. I think it was before iPod, so I might have actually had like a CD player in my pocket. I'm not sure. I don't think I had iPod until I was like 25. I think it was a big CD player, yes. It was my mixtape, bro. My mixed CD. I think it had like Let It Rain on it. And let It Rain. Just the, the end of the flowers, they were in. All right, I know, get to the point. So I get in there and I do my strategy and go into the zone and I look up at 11 o'clock and I cut all the flowers. So I got there at 6, done by 11. Five hours, something that was taking me 16. I'm not saying that to brag, I'm saying that, what was the answer? Go to heaven, get the solution, work hard. And what, what do you think the effects were with the people around me that I was working with? Hey man, how did you cut all the flowers that fast? Ooh, I went to heaven about it. Well, that's weird. Yeah, it's kind of weird, but it worked, right? It goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, can you pray for me? Yeah. Little things like that open up hearts for people, right? Now, there's been times when I've, I've totally screwed up a job and I was a victim and it was the boss's fault. But right there, I took ownership because I'm in charge of me and I'm a powerful person. 
And what was the end result? Kingdom, kingdom impact. What does revival look like? Cutting flowers. One of the uh, strategies, I cut the roses first. They're thorny. I had thick gloves on. Get those hard, thorny roses out of the way. Right? Covert revival. Work hard. Love well. Be thankful. Be full of his presence. Who's heard of Brother Lawrence? Right? Brother Lawrence was a monk. And he would wash dishes for the community. I know, wow. Like, what's your inspiring, like, what's your aspirations in life? I want to wash dishes in the glory. But that's what he did. And guess what? People would come from miles around to watch him wash dishes in the glory. Isn't that crazy? But it's not quite crazy because there's actually a scripture for it. Who knows what it is? What happened when the Queen of Sheba saw how the table of Solomon was set? The forks and knives and the dishes. <gasps> she like falls out in the spirit. Because without realizing it, when she walked into Israel, she walked off the earth into a heavenly place. And she saw a table set in the earth just like it would have been set in heaven. My God. The least in your kingdom is greater than the kings and queens in ours. I see potential in you. I'm kind of straying away a little bit, but there's something going on here. Believe in yourself. Believe in your potential. Believe in who God has created and designed you to be. One moment of believing. What was David doing? He was bringing meat and cheese to the battlefield that he wasn't invited to. Hey guys, I got your sandwiches. But David had a, had a unique problem. He had been staring at the size of God all day when everyone else had been staring at the size of Goliath. He shows up. He hears something. I defy the armies of the living God. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> what? Who said that? He looked over. The champion. Where? The champion Goliath, the giant. Oh, the grasshopper. Goliath. He had a heaven to earth perspective, not a hiding behind the rock, earth to heaven perspective. He had been heavenly places. So he runs down. He couldn't put the armor of Saul on because David was already wearing his armor. He goes to the presence, five smooth stones, revelation. And before he slings the stone, he prophesies. He could have slung that stone to the broad side of a barn and only had one destination because he released the word like a rock, revelation, before he put action to it. Right? And that's how we can frame our days. I'm going to work today. I prophesy that at work today, my day is going to be awesome. I'm going to have divine encounters. People are going to experience your glory. I'm going to have answers and solutions to problems that people can't figure out. Right? I'm going to have multi-million dollar ideas that can be a benefit and blessing to my family and then I can begin to be a benefit and blessing to others and create a heaven to earth economy that transforms the nation. We were sitting at someone's house recently and we were, I was like, what are you dreaming about? And she goes, forgiving the debts of nations. I'm like, what? I mean, that took my like abundance provision radar off the Richter scale. I mean, like maybe Elon Musk can do that, right? Like, who has the ability to forgive the debt of a nation? And so she was dreaming way beyond. Like, I thought I was in there. Pastor Dave's in here. He's going to ask you a great coaching question. What are you dreaming about? She was already way ahead of me, man. Her answer caused me to metanoia. And that's how iron sharpens iron. We get around. What are you dreaming about? Oh, wow, I'm dreaming about this. Or it could be, hey, I don't have any vision right now. I'm not dreaming. Ah, what caused you to dream in the past? When did you feel most alive? Oh, I felt alive here and here. What if you began to dream about that again, but now you're dreaming on a, on a different level? What would that look like? Leif Hetland calls it, sometimes you just got to go back to the future. Got to go back to the memory stones. Well, I, I can't see God right now, but when I was over here, man, God was moving. It was powerful. It was glory. Man, God was moving here. And somehow right, right here, I can't see where he's at. But when I look at where I've been, I can see where I'm going. It can change my trajectory. Tracking? 
I'm on my last page of notes, and we're doing good. All right? Heavenly solutions, creativity, heavenly influence, covert use of spiritual gifts. You don't have to stop, put your Christian hat on, and say, I'm going to prophesy to you right now. Oh, wow. Like, you can just begin to release something. Wait, what? Oh, I, I feel like you have this strategy. Do you, you, you ever dream? Oh, yeah, I do dream. Well, I, I think God's been speaking to you through your dreams. So you, what you can do is be subtle and then all of a sudden share something with the use of a spiritual gift, with the gift of discernment, right? Interpretation. Sometimes you're, you're interpreting the times like the sons of Iskar. And then you've heard me say this before. What does overt, re look, overt revival look like? Matthew 10, 8. Here's a Bible verse. You ready? What does it say? As you go, preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And so, you know what's so amazing about that? Is that in Genesis, Jesus says, or the Father says, go and subdue the earth. But when they stepped out of their identity, you see, you see things emerge in the earth like weeds that weren't supposed to be there, like sin, sickness, decay, disease, right? And all of a sudden, you have, you have a son of Adam in the earth, the second Adam who knows his identity. And what is he doing in his life and ministry? He's eradicating all these things that ha don't have legal access to be there. And now he looks at the disciples and says, as you go, don't only do what I did, but do greater things. So as they go... They begin to make the desert look back like a garden by healing the sick. Oh, sickness isn't supposed to be around. Okay, heal it. Raising the dead. Cleansing the lepers. And it's not just healing the sick. It's like this whole framework, this whole idea and reality of life lived at a lesser level than God's design. That's why it started the message with God's original design and intention is the very fruit and definition of revival. <gasps> Wait, anxiety, gone. Sickness, gone. Trauma, gone. Raising the dead, yes, raising people back to life. Raising dead dreams, dead promises. Raising dead relationships and brokenness, right? Leprosy is something that gets on you that causes life to decay when life is supposed to be flourishing and thriving. That can look like thoughts. It can look like physical ailments, right? Like, so we're releasing the cleansing solution of creation. We're all just bottles of essential oil. That was kind of sort of supposed to be funny. <laughs> sometimes spur of the moment's great. Sometimes spur of the moment's, man. So here's the cool thing about overt and covert revival. They're both prominent in the, books of, in the book of Acts, in the epistles, and in the early church. You know, well, sometimes it doesn't stop and say, well, here, here a business leader was impacted. No, you see someone named Lydia who was of great importance who funded Paul's gospel, who has some type of stream of income coming in. You see her life get transformed and impacted. Sometimes you've got to read between the lines to realize the power of the gospel and how it was able to transform the Roman Empire who would, cru who would crucify you for not saying Caesar is Lord. That's why the Christians would go around saying Jesus is Lord. I don't worship Caesar. I worship Yeshua. Right? So both of those are prominent in the early church. You, you see this thing to where Jesus is transforming culture and that's actually the definition of the apostolic. It means sent one. They were generals who would go to a culture and change the culture from the indigenous culture to the culture of Rome. And if you change the culture, then people won't want to rebel because what are they rebelling against? So apostles are builders. They're culturizers. Right? So trad revival, that's my short word for traditional revival. So we'll make trad a fad because I think it kind of sounds rad. Yes, I've just recently become a dad. <laughs> Traditional revivals would focus only on the overt portion of revival. But a kingdom revival focuses on overt revival and covert revival. The leaven that leavens the whole lump. Before you know it, you can't find anyone in your office who's not a believer. Right? It's that seed, it's that influence. The Great Awakenings were powerful. There's astonishing signs and wonders, you know. 
Um, one of our heartbeats is to really cherish revival history, to teach it. We've got, I've got two personal books on it. You know, we, we taught it for many, many years at Bethel Atlanta when we were teachers at the school there. And we've seen God just do some amazing, incredible things talking about these revivals. But if I go back to that and try to recreate that, then I'm not building on the foundation that they laid. So what I want to do with these traditional revivals is not say they're wrong or incorrect, but I want to build on that foundation but see God do something brand new in our generation. Huh? Okay. I thought Alicia was like telling me to like, <laughs> it's coming from behind. So they, they transform cities, right? These great awakenings transform cities, but they didn't transform culture. Instead of transforming culture, they put up religious restrictions rather than create a culture of freedom anchored in responsibility. You see the difference? You're free. You're a son of God. You're free to do what you want to do, but with that freedom comes responsibility. Right? And if we quote Spider-Man, huh? Yes. Yes, everyone comes alive when you say Spider-Man. All right, so real quick, point number two. One, number one was just looking at traditional and kingdom revival and how can we look at revival from a kingdom culture. Because my whole goal is thrival, right? Not just coming from sleepy time to awake time, but thriving while we're awake, right? So number two, maintaining and increasing revival. And you see that modeled in Acts. So Acts 2, day of Pentecost, they're all together praying in one pl place. And what happens? Whoosh, whoosh. Suddenly there comes a sound like a mighty rushing wind. I was at Bethel Atlanta one day and they asked me to come in and talk about purity. I have a book on purity called Radical Purity. It's, it's great. It's, about, it's a real easy read. But how do you talk to teenagers about purity and then captivate their attention when their hormones are raging? That's a delicate balance, right? Well, not, why not have heaven come and kiss it with a bigger yes that, that seals the reason why you keep yourself pure for marriage? That make sense? And so that's basically what I said when we were done talking about purity. I said, everyone put your hands out. I feel like God wants to kiss this moment. I can feel the wind of God right now swirling around my hands as I'm talking. But that's exactly what happened right there then, right? I said, put your hands out. I feel like God's refreshing, pure wind is going to come in here right now and just breathe over you, right? So the kids put their hands out, and the wind of God came into the room. Papers started going different directions. Kids started jumping up and down. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe what's happening. It was like a rushing wind came into the room, and it stamped the moment. It stamped the moment with purity. The things in the Bible, these aren't sealed back over here. They're an invitation for what God has always done and what God continues to do and what God continues to do through expansion and through metanoia in our generation. I don't read this and think, man, that was great for them, God. I read it and say, Lord, there's got to be more for us here and now. Right? And I promise you, when you see the wind of God physically blow into a room full of teenagers and see their faces light up, you won't be the same. And to stand up in front of a room full of teenagers and say, the wind of God's going to come through here. You're physically going to feel it. You can't fake it. They're teenagers. It's either going to happen or you're going to be laughed out of the room. <laughs> Who is this guy? Right? I don't say that in arrogance. I say that in humility. So what happens in Acts, he's touching them with these, with these amazing encounters because in reality it says his, his ministers are winds, they're flames of fire. They felt what they were called to become. They felt the wind, they become wind. They feel fire, they become fire. So they prayed and they have an outpouring and thousands come to the Lord in Acts 2. Is that the only time they were filled in the book of Acts? No, they got filled again. Chapter 4, two chapters over. They got together and they prayed. And what happened? Who knows? The house began to shake. I was praying one day, kind of like this. I was trying to do the Elijah thing, you know, like head between your knees, but I'm not that flexible, so they weren't quite between my knees. <laughs> like I need to do some more mobility training if I'm going to pray like Elijah. 
Hey, that could be a good thing. Stream of income. No, I'm kidding. Don't exploit the gospel. Um, don't hear what I'm not saying. All right, back. Dave, come on. At least you left the room. No, I just go, go bonkers. She's like, she gives me the eye. Like, keep on track. <laughs> so I'm praying. I'm in my office. Um, who's ever had one of those prayer times? Man, you're doing it. You're praying, but you're just not feeling anything. And that's what was happening right there. I was thinking, this must be one of those times. I'm going to get a pat on the back from Papa God. Good job, Dave. You prayed even though you didn't feel anything. Great. Kudos to you. Oh, thanks, God. I'm actually like reciting this in my head. I quit praying. And in the next moment, I heard this. It sounded like someone had walked up onto my front porch. But I knew immediately it wasn't the UPS man, it wasn't the Jehovah's Witness. Although that would have been really interesting. <laughs> I knew it was an angel. And in the next moment, my entire house began to shake and vibrate. I've been in a couple of, like, you know, the weird Georgia earthquakes that, like, it's not quite as intense as, like, anyone from Cali? Anyone feel a Cali quake? Okay, I haven't felt one of those. But we've had had a couple of Georgia tremors before. But I'm, I'm sitting there, and my house begins to shake and vibrate. And so, like, you would think, I'm like, oh, God, your glory, it's amazing. But actually, I start thinking this, oh, my God, my house is shaking. I wasn't feeling anything a second ago, but now the house is shaking in God's presence. What do I do? This is amazing. I hope the chandelier, I had this weird, crazy, like, 90s chandelier above me, and, like, because my office was technically the dining room. So I'm thinking, man, I hope that thing doesn't follow me and stab me in the back. Oh, my God, my house is shaking. Oh, wow, this is glorious. Man, I hope that chandelier doesn't follow me, right? My mind couldn't handle the encounter that I was having. And often that's the case. That's how you can be in the service where God's moving, things get weird, and some people just can't quite handle it. However, some of the people who question and can't handle it, you go back and visit them in five or ten years, and they're the ambassadors of the movement. Thomas was known for doubting, right? He shows up and sees Jesus, and Thomas says, My Lord, my God. I know we're going a little long, man, but I feel the presence. He says, My Lord, my God. It says, When Jesus was on the earth, all the fullness of the cosmos was inside of him, even when he was walking on the earth. And so when he shows up, he says, No, no, put your hand in my hand in my side. What did, St what did Thomas stick his hand into? The otherworldly. If you go to the highest heavenly place and you're standing around God's throne, there's no other place to go but one. And that's to go in. That's to experience union. Yes. You know, Thomas's arm is in a box in India. It has not decayed. And the rest of his body is in a different part of the country. I'm not making this up. Google it. You can go there and see it. And everyone in India knows it because when Thomas went to India to bring the gospel, he stuck his hand in water and threw the water up in the air and all the water stayed there. Just in, like in that movie, that magician movie, right? If what I'm saying sounds crazy, read your Bible. <laughs> I mean, Ezekiel is like being carried by his hair from Babylon back to Jerusalem, right? Well, I'm, what, what I'm trying to do is say, look, this is an invitation for us. And so when they prayed again, they were filled with boldness. The building began to shake. So in the first series of events after their first prayer, outpouring in thousands, in the second series of events after they prayed, um, you see the lame healed, you see signs and wonders, you see angelic encounters, you see translocation and extraordinary miracles, right? And so through the book of Acts, they would go into God's presence, they would come out and God would begin to move. They would go into God's presence, they would come out, and God would begin to move. And slowly over time, the whole kingdom began to, the, the, the whole culture began to feel the impact of it, right? So what if we dared to believe God for our city? What if we dared to believe God to do that here in Atlanta? Sound good? Yes. All right, let's stand up. You guys all right? Anyone stretch just a little bit? Like, well, we're stretching now, actually. <laughs> you know, when I was a physical trainer, if, if I didn't stretch my clients or cause them to burn, then 
I hadn't actually done my job. My goal was to take them just a little bit beyond what they are used to so that their muscles would grow back bigger and stronger, right? And some of the, you know, the, the stored energy or fat cells, you know, stored energy that wasn't supposed to be there could be burned off, right? And so there's things I learned in, in training people for fitness that I couldn't have learned in the seminaries I went to. But there's something about us daring to trust God, even with the unknowing, even with going beyond what our imaginations are willing to do and say, Lord, I don't understand it, but I believe you. I trust you, Lord. Then we arrive right where Evan Roberts was at, where he said, bend me, oh God, bend me. He was willing to go beyond what he could see, what he could hear what he could feel, and he stepped into this realm where the whole nation felt the impact of one person's walk with God. What can God do with you? What can he do with us? What can he do with this small church? Hey, baby. Well, if in the spirit, we're, the, we're, we're like the, the tallest skyscraper shining here, but we don't know it, and there's unexplored floors above us and above us. Well, if we met Tanoia, what if we expand our vision and all that we believe is possible? Elise and I moved up here from the beach. Elise and I moved up here because we believed that there was a people gathered together and assembled. This is for you, Stephen. We believe there's a people gathered together who would dare to believe God for the impossible and say, you know what, we can't take this city. What if Atlanta can become? Atlanta is the biggest portal city in the world. You had port cities that caused the gospel to go all across the Mediterranean in the no world at the time. I really love the picture on the speaker. That feels cool. I know. I got I to gotta bring it back down to earth, but don't worry. I'm still human. Atlanta has the biggest port in the world right now, airport. And from here, you can go anywhere. And so one of the things we were thinking when we came back up here was, like, our vision's expanded now. We've been reset and refreshed. What if God begins to move? And just like I talked about last time with the signal fires, what if the fires begin to go to the far ends of the earth because of your yes, because of our yes, right? Are you guys feeling this? Mm -hmm. Put your hands out in front of you. Ah, ha, 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 yes. You ready? During worship, I had my hands out like this, and the Lord walked up to me, and he set a burning staff full of fire in my hands. And, and when he set that in my hand, I felt this new level of measure and authority. It was a rod that was burning that I'd never felt before. And I thought, this is it. And now, even as we're standing here, I see him giving each one of us our own staff, burning with fire. And it represents who you really are, your calling, and your authority to release the kingdom of heaven, the love of God, and the power of the gospel to this people. Right? Right? Fire! We're all models. We're all models for the younger generation to rise up. We're all models to make it safe for the younger generation to not be ashamed that they go somewhere where everyone is burning on fire and they don't care what people think about them loving Jesus unashamedly. So Lord, let your fire, let your wind come into the room even now. Refresh us as a church. God, refresh us as a people. Lord, take us to places we've never been before. Lord, show us things about us, things that you put inside of us, even before we were formed in our mother's womb, that are promises that you've designed us to carry, God. And Lord, I break all past trauma and shame in the room in Jesus' name.
no more. God, no more, on the, uh, no more time on the treadmill of not knowing who we really are and struggling with things that you've already delivered us from, God. Lord, let this, let this be the hour, the time, and the day that we rise into our true identity as sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, and brothers and sisters doing life together in your presence. Lord, let it be real, not just something we recite and repeat and we have great language for. God, let us become the thing. A kingdom family. When things get hard, we have powerful conversations and we look for healing. Not for a reason to exit, but for a reason to elevate. Not for a reason to divide God, but a reason to come together. Each one of us in here come from all walks of life. We all have something valuable to put on the table. And just by being here for a month, man, I'm energized. Me and Elisa, we're energized. We're changed. You guys are, are breathing life into us. So let us be life and breathe life into one another. <laughs> Holy Spirit, come right now. Holy Spirit. Fill us from our heads to our feet, God. Fill the kiddos. <laughs> hmm. More, Lord. More of you, God. More of you, God. More, more, more. Haha. <laughs> more than enough. Lord, I thank you for this family. <laughs> Man. I thank you for their hearts to be here, God. Thank you for their heart for you, Lord. Lord, increase their time with you, not through effort, but through being lovesick. Lord, just make us lovesick for you, God. When I was in high school, I, 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 after I had given my life to Jesus, I would just go to the library and read my Bible. I didn't know I was fasting. I hadn't learned about that yet. But something inside of me was just more hungry for the Lord than I was hungry for food, God. So Lord, just, just let us find these moments to where all of a sudden we, we don't even realize how we got there. We just find that we've been praying we, be, we, we find that we've been calling some up, someone up to encourage them. And we just find ourselves wrapped up right in the middle of you. I know this is one of those moments, man, where we could just camp here all day. It's a delicate balance. One time Jesus goes, please, please, just give me five more minutes. Five minutes later, all of heaven opened up. So I'm going to honor you. If you need to leave, it's okay. We love you. We bless you. That's all right. That's the way the kingdom works. If, if I have a time where I have to leave, I know someone else is going to be burning in my place. 
and there comes a moment where someone else has to leave, I know that I'll be burning in their place. So let's linger. Do we have that song, Revival's in the Air? Can we pull that one up? Or we're just going to play a song and just, just, just ally. I was going to say a line, but we're just going to ally our hearts with heaven. If you want to pray together or pray with someone. But just, just you guys get some out of this today? Yeah. I've reached the end of language. I've reached the end of myself here. My whole goal is just to inspire us to burn. To be a people, a family on fire. Sound good? Yes. Everybody say family on fire. Family on fire. All right. We'll see you next week. Love you guys.